I love it when a new release of Ubuntu comes out because it's one of my favorite distributions to review. I've been using Ubuntu since the very first release and I've used every release since and it's just fascinating to see the project grow and evolve and change over the years. You know, we saw the original version with GNOME 2 and then we saw it change and when it adopted Unity as its interface and then back to GNOME again. There's just been all kinds of exciting changes and in today's video we're going to check out the latest release. It's finally here. Ubuntu 19.10 has been released and that's exactly what we're going to check out in this video. It has some great new features and we're going to check that out. Before we begin, one quick note. I am testing a new camera and new microphone setup. Um, it might not look that much different as the Yeti, but I'm you know, adjusting the settings, but trying to get the audio and video quality settings where I want them. So hopefully the audio doesn't sound too scratchy or too bad, but let me know in the comments below what you think of the overall video quality. So with that out of the way, uh, let's talk about Ubuntu 19.10. And here it is. Here is the Ubuntu 1910 desktop in all of its glory. We have this awesome, cool looking wallpaper right here using the same color scheme as they've been using, but they basically just changed the wallpaper to represent their mascot in each release, which they have done here as well. But one thing that I did notice is that the icon theme here is you know, it looks a lot better. I'm, I'm not a fan of the, you know, the orange personally. I would have liked to see other color variations here, but in my opinion, it does look professional and well done and modern. So I do like the look and feel regardless. Now, I don't feel like the theme is a huge change from the last release, but I do see minor changes all over the place that overall just make it look like a better experience. It seems like there's more coloration on the icons, the window border here uh, seems to have more color gradient going on here. So they're not doing the flat theme that everybody thought was going to be the biggest thing in the world um, some time ago. Um, everything looks definitely more modern. So that's pretty awesome. Now let's look at the theme options. Now GNOME is not the most themable desktop in the world. Yes, you can go to gnomelook.org and download themes and things like that but you know the theme engine is a little bit hard to write themes for but let's go ahead and look at what they're including but first of all what's interesting is that the utility you would use to change the appearance isn't here and it's called gnome tweak and you have to actually install it so i'll open up ubuntu software here and let's get that installed i'll just go ahead and search for tweak should be among the results here and it is there's there's gnome tweaks and i'll install it Should install pretty quick. There it is, so let's launch it. And if we go to appearance, we can see that the theme is called Yaru, and we can actually change it to, let's say, Yaru Dark. Hope I'm pronouncing that right, which actually, this looks pretty awesome, honestly. I really like this. Dark themes definitely seem to be all the rage nowadays, but if you'd like to go in the opposite direction, then you can go to Yaru Light, which basically makes everything a light theme, even the window border, which is actually dark by default. So this is the default right here. And then for the icon theme, you know, we have different ones here. We have the Yaru by default, but we can go to the old school humanity icon theme from back in the day that's still there. I'm going to go ahead and set that back to Yaru, but you get the idea. So with GNOME Tweaks, you could basically customize additional things that are not present in the normal GNOME settings. Honestly, I don't understand why this isn't installed by default. I think it's a useful thing to have, but then again, this is consisting of things that people generally don't tweak all that often, so they're put into their own app. And I would like to see this combined into GNOME Settings. I've never understood why we need GNOME Tweaks and GNOME Settings. What constitutes a tweak versus a setting, and where do you draw the line there? I've never understood that. Hopefully, at some point, they consolidate that. Now, it's not Ubuntu's job to do that, or Canonical, the developers of Ubuntu's job to do that. It's GNOME's job if they want to, because it's, you know, across the board. Any distribution with GNOME as a default desktop will likely have GNOME tweaks available, and all those settings will be separate from the normal settings app. So the installation process hasn't really changed all that much from previous releases. You simply 
write the ISO image that you download to a flash drive using a utility such as Etcher, which I have a video for on my channel already. And then you enter whatever key combination accesses the boot menu. And then you select the boot device, that's your flash drive. And then you're presented with a selection screen at the very beginning that will allow you to jump right into the installation or try Ubuntu without installing, which is what I did and what I always do, what I recommend you do. This gives you an option to preview Ubuntu and how it's going to work with your hardware before you commit to installing it. If you have hardware issues where you need specific drivers that aren't there that you have to download after the fact, you can use one of the other options here such as uh, safe graphics for example and if you are preparing your computer for somebody else or you're reselling computers or, or something like that you can choose the OEM installation option but as always try Ubuntu without installing is what I go with and this part hasn't changed from previous releases once you're at the live desktop you basically as always just give it a test make sure everything works as you expect and once you feel comfortable you just go ahead and double click on this icon right here, install Ubuntu 1910. And again, this hasn't changed much since previous releases. And then from there, you just fill out the various screens and your installation will be ready to go before you know it. And then once the installation is complete, you just simply restart now and then you will reboot into your new installation. So one thing that I really like about this release that I think is really cool is we have this new option right here, experimental, erase disk, and use ZFS. And this is cool because ZFS is a great file system. It is a little bit more memory hungry, actually a decent amount more <laughs> memory hungry, but just keep that in mind, it does use additional RAM but it does offer a lot of resiliency when it comes to basically protecting your data. But I'll leave it up to you to decide if that's worth it. It is listed as experimental, so you shouldn't use that in production. But that's just something to keep in mind if um, you know that's something you want to test out. And when I did the review, that is exactly what I did. Now the installation, again, pretty much exactly the same as before, different artwork. We have a new ZFS option, but for the most part, it is the same. And I think it takes somewhere for me between five to eight minutes to install, which is not that bad. Uh, this is an SSD, but this laptop is really old though. It's about three or more years old, something like that. It's tried and true, it works great, but the installation would probably be even faster than that on newer hardware. So um, I don't think anyone will complain about five to eight minutes, but you know, for me, I think that's more than fine. And the installation process is very professional. Um, it, it gets the job done. It's just, it's just a well done installer. Now, the thing is, it is the same installer that we've had for several releases now. Um, hopefully they update it, but then again, they don't have to update it because it does work. So the installation process is great and uh, pretty straightforward. And with that out of the way, let's go ahead and check out some of the new features. But before we do, I just want to mention my sponsor, Linode. Linode has a special offer for subscribers of Learn Linux TV. If you watch my channel, no doubt you're interested in tinkering with things like computers, Linux servers, and the like. So that's why Linode wants your help testing out their new data center coming to Sydney, Australia by the end of 2019. Sign up to become a beta tester by visiting the link in the description and you'll be notified by email when the beta opens for testing. By joining the beta program, you'll even have the opportunity to be the first to test other Linode products in the future. Be sure to check the I want to be a beta tester box when you sign up. And a big thank you to Linode for sponsoring my channel and my content. I really appreciate it. Now back to Ubuntu 19.10. And when you first log in to your new installation, you are going to be presented with a screen that's going to ask if you'd like to help improve Ubuntu, which is basically sending system information to the developers. 
to basically help improve it and keep track of what's popular and different hardware configurations and whatnot. Now, I do recommend you send it. I don't see any reason why not to. You did most likely download this for free after all. But in my case, I'm going to say no since this is just a test installation. But if you're curious, you can click show the first report right here. And it's going to give you some information about what it's going to be sending to them. So as you can see right here, it's actually sending information about my hardware and it's sending information about my time zone and things like that. So I'll click next. Location services are disabled by default, but if you're going to be using any applications that will make use of your geographic location, then you might want to consider turning this on. Uh, no Maps is an example of an application like that. I'm going to go ahead and turn that on. What's cool is that you are presented with a list of applications here that are popular. So if you are a Skype user or use VLC or Slack for work or anything like that, then uh, maybe one of these applications would benefit you and you can get that installed right away. I do use VLC, so I'll go ahead and click on that. And it opens up the Ubuntu software application, which is what I'll get into here in a moment. But it gives you a chance to install that application, so you just basically put in your password. And I'm loving that the screen in the background here is watching My Little Pony. That is awesome. And it's installed, so I'll go ahead and launch it to show that it does work. Let's see. And there it is. And you can, of course, install any of these applications that you'd like. You can then open software, which is also going to be here on the left, Ubuntu software. So if you uh, lose this screen, it's, it's not going to basically come up the next time you log in. You can simply just click on it right here. So. You can see here that it actually is showing me that I have updates, but I'm not going to install those right now. Let's go ahead and launch Ubuntu software. And with this, it's basically your, you know, it's your basic package installer. It's where you go to install your software, whatever it is you'd like to install. So for example, games, let's go ahead and click on that. Basically just find an app you want to install, like, you know, Minecraft, for example. And you, you just saw me install VLC, pretty much the same thing. So it's pretty easy to use. It's not gonna, going to win any awards for being the most advanced software management utility in the world, but it definitely gets the job done and performs very well. And speaking of performance, that's one of the features that the Ubuntu developers are bragging about. They're saying that this release has built even more speed, that it's just become a little bit more responsive. And you know what? It does certainly seem that way because when I open up applications, it's pretty quick to open things up, as you can see. Now, this is an older laptop, so um, of course I'm going to notice the speed increase probably more than most. So if your machine has a crazy fast i7 or i9 processor, you may or may not notice a difference. But, you know, honestly, the performance benefit in my test, it, it does feel faster but not orders of magnitude faster, but anything that they do to increase the performance and responsiveness is definitely welcome. And I'm very glad to see that the GNOME development has been trending in that direction. Another feature worth noting here is the inclusion of ZFS, which I mentioned briefly when I was going over the installation. Now this is the first release of Ubuntu with ZFS as an option in the desktop installer. It's not the first release of Ubuntu with ZFS, but it does now allow you to do an installation with ZFS as your root file system on the desktop release. And ZFS offers greater resiliency, but I think for most of you, it's probably not going to be recommended. I mean, let's face it, this is the first release where they're offering it on the desktop, so it might make sense to um, basically omit that and just go with the standard installation for now. And maybe we'll revisit this in a future release. I haven't in encountered any problems myself, but this is release day. So um, if any problems are going to come up, they're going to come up within a week or so. So, um, you know, we just need more time on this release. But I think we also need more time for ZFS to marinate, so to speak. We just want to make it, um, you know, get more testing. And I think that's exactly what this will do. When people install 
and they use the ZFS option, it'll give them an opportunity to play around with it. But if you are using this for productivity purposes, I don't recommend ZFS just yet. I think that you should just stick with the tried and true. And then again, maybe in the future that will change. But it's awesome that they included that by default here. Now ZFS really shines when you have more than one hard disk on your machine. This is just a laptop with a single drive. So it's not going to really benefit me on this machine all that much. But ZFS does give you greater data resiliency, but it also requires more RAM. So just kind of, you know, you just kind of need that, need to keep that in mind because it could impact performance a bit. So overall, I really like this release. There's no huge standout features, but you know, I guess you could argue ZFS is a standout feature. It's definitely the most controversial, but I think the priority right now for the developers is getting everything solidified to start working on 2004, the next release of Ubuntu coming in April, which will be a long-term supported release. Now, one thing to mention here is that there is no 32-bit version available when it comes to this release. So if you have a really old computer that, you know, has a 32-bit only processor, you're not going to be able to download 1910 for that. But while that might seem controversial, I really feel like people blow that way out of proportion and that the lack of 32-bit support basically affects absolutely nobody. And I know that's a bold claim, but I do feel that is true. And the reason why is because, you know, we've had 64-bit support in processors for a very long time. The Pentium 4 HT, which is very, very old, was supporting 64-bit. And then the AMD Athlon 64 existed, you know, that was that came out a very long time ago. So the likelihood that anybody has a computer worth using today that doesn't support 64-bit, I just don't really feel like that's going to be a very common thing. And what I find is that when a lot of people complain about 32-bit support being taken away, they're under the impression that their computer doesn't support 64-bit software when it actually does, because 64-bit has been around a lot longer than people think in the Linux community. So it's important to keep in mind that, you know, the bigger issue here is that we're running GNOME, and GNOME is running very fast, it's very efficient, but if you have a 32-bit only processor, chances are it's so old it's not going to support this software anyway, even if Canonical did make a 32-bit version available. And the reason why I feel like this affects basically nobody is because there's still a lot of distributions out there, even older releases of Ubuntu and Debian, even the current Debian, I think, or at least the old one, supports 32-bit. So those are still supported distributions now. So given that there are still supported distributions out there, you're still able to keep your 32-bit only machine running if you have one. But there's no, really no reason for the Ubuntu developers to keep uh, maintaining 32-bit support when all it's doing is taking them away from work that they could be doing, improving the distribution in other ways. Now the big question is, should I upgrade to this release? In the previous release, I basically said no. I don't think that anybody should because I feel like everyone should stick to LTS. There is really no reason to use non-LTS. And this is an intermediary release. It's only supported for about nine months. And LTS releases, long-term support releases, are supported for anywhere from three to five years, depending on which version you download. And most of the changes in these intermediary releases are backported to LTS, so you don't really lose anything by sticking to LTS. And there's generally no features that are absolutely amazing enough in the intermediary releases to basically make you want to upgrade. And when I mentioned that, it basically was a, a controversial video, but you know, the thing is, um, I do stand by that, but not this time though, because I do feel that 1910 is the best fit for most people looking for a desktop release of Linux today. And the reason why is because the next LTS release is right around the corner. If you install 1910 right now, you'll be able to upgrade directly to that release when it comes out. Also, if you don't have an installation of Ubuntu and you're looking to get started, as of the time I'm recording this video, 1910 is a great place to go to get started because you'll be upgraded into 2004 when that comes out. You can basically upgrade directly into that release. 
And if you're already running, you know, 1904, for example, then there's no reason not to upgrade to this one. So I think the only situation in which I wouldn't recommend upgrading is if you're currently running 1804, there's no reason to upgrade to this one because you'll be able to go directly to 2004 when it comes out in six months. And, you know, it's not supported to go directly from 1804 to 1910 in an upgrade unless you're doing a clean install. So that's just something to keep in mind. If you're running 1804, you have a lot more work to do to get it upgraded to 1910. But when 2004 comes out, you can upgrade in one step. So just keep that in mind. Overall, my time with this release has been great. I mean, it's just, like I mentioned, very responsive. Everything just seems fluid. I don't know if there's going to be any clipping in the screen recording, but when I'm looking at my laptop screen, everything just moves around the screen smooth. It's very fast and responsive. I'm loving the new GNOME release. I think that it's great. So I have nothing but good things to say about this release. The only thing that I might caution you guys on is, well, you know, today's release day. So, you know, time will tell how stable this is. In testing the beta, I've had no problems whatsoever personally with my hardware in particular. And I have no reason not to recommend it to you guys. But again, since it's release day, you know, after a week or two, we'll see if there's any reports of instability when the mass public starts using it. But from my perspective so far, I think that it's been running just fine. So if you've had a chance to check out Ubuntu 19.10, what are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments below, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for checking out my video. I really appreciate it. If you found it useful, click that like button. And if you haven't already done so, make sure you subscribe so you'll see the latest content as soon as it becomes available. If you want to help me out, there's links down below for my Patreon page, as well as links for purchasing my Linux books and also my affiliate store, which has a listing of Linux compatible hardware that I've actually tested personally. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video.